Uh, thank you so much, worship team, for leading us. And I love that song, and I, it doesn't get old being just behind that door, hearing your voices be raised higher than these voices, singing those songs. And you know, that specific song, what I love about that song is we didn't sing, I'm going to pray about, think about building my life. We are like, I will build my life. I, this, there's a determination to the words you just sang, like, I'm doing this, this is happening. And I do believe that that is, that is important. In, in this faith journey that we call Christianity, that determination. But what's also cool is even in the lyrics of that song, we recognize that we can't do it alone and, and that that's not a part of God's will either. We don't do it alone. He will fill us with his love. He will show us. He will lead us into his way if we let him. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today, uh, but we're going to do it in sort of a random way. I want to talk to you about something really, really important in my life. Um, and it's bumper stickers. I am entertained at long intersections by looking at the decals and the bumper stickers. Anybody else with me on that? They're pretty entertaining. Sometimes creepy, sometimes weird, sometimes like, okay, I don't want to read that, you know. Uh, but it helps in Northern Kentucky to, to have something to do while you're waiting at a long intersection. How many of y'all live in Florence, Kentucky? All right, we got a couple. We got a few, you know. I, I'm, your patience is amazing um, because I've gotten to the point in my life where I, if I have to go to Florence, I may not go to Florence because <laughs> this traffic is so, like the lights are so long. I mean, you just got, you got to be ready to be patient and chill and just enjoy the ride. But I have noticed lately, and I've had to go to Florence a few times lately, uh, that um, I've seen a lot of cool, funny bumper stickers. Now, the ones I'm going to show you are not... I've seen something like these before, but I did a little research, have a little fun with. These are some entertaining bumper stickers that I have discovered. If you're a big fan of the Lord of the Rings, you'll appreciate this bumper sticker decal, you shall not pass. Little, little Gandalf the wizard there. And then let's just go ahead and get the creepy stuff out of the way. If you see this bumper sticker on a van run, strangers have the best candy. Stay away from that vehicle. Give them a lot of cushion. And then some people don't like cats and they want the world to know about it. <laughs> Lost your cat, try looking under my tongue. And I, I want to pause here for a moment because I forgot to uh, uh, sort of give you a little background here. The reason I'm talking about this is because I have a perspective about bumper stickers that may or may not be accurate, but my personal experience with bumper stickers, I don't put them on very often, very rare. And it's because the first couple that I ever put on a car absolutely cannot take them off. They're like a tattoo for your car. So my perspective on bumper stickers is if, if you put it on your car, this is very important to you. You want the entire world to know this about you. So whatever's on your car, I'm thinking, that's you, man. Like you, that's your number one thing you want the world to know about you. That may be a little bit too intense, but that's just the way I feel about it. So when I see this, I'm like, Man, you hate cats. All right, good to know. Um, and then this is my favorite one I'm going to show you. Dyslexics are teeple poo. I mean, that's cute, right? That is awesome. Now, some people just like to have fun with the obvious, like this is the back of my car. That's a good one, you know. And then uh, this person's uh, exhaust tailpipe was shaped like an HDMI port, so they decided to have some fun with that. I like that. Uh, then, you know, some people just want to dispense important practical wisdom like be nice to your kids. They will choose your nursing home. Uh, and then some people just want to be confessional. I was an honor student. I don't know what happened. All right, that's cool. And then, of course, you got your really cheesy Christian bumper stickers like, uh-huh, that's a good one. If, are you following Jesus this closely? Um, and then this person, again, if you, I mean... You just got to hate your car to do this, in my opinion. Like, the car that I drive probably should be covered in more bumper stickers, but I'm like, that's, that's going to be, that's never coming off. Um, so the reason I'm bringing this up is, again, my perspective on bumper stickers is this must be really important for you, that you would put something very sticky on your vehicle that you know may not come off. So it begs the question, 
what do you want to be known for? What do you want people to know about you? What is so important to you about your life? What is so much of a priority in your life that you'd be willing to maybe tattoo it on your car, put it on your social media feeds or whatever? What is it that you want to be known for? Um, I happen to do, as a lot of pastors do, a lot of funerals. And on occasion, um, I'll do funerals of people that I really don't know that well. And what it is is that a lot of people, when they reach that moment and they're needing to do a funeral service, you know, maybe they've not gone to church in a long time or maybe they've never been to church, but they really want to minister to be a part of this. And so um, some of the local ministers will be called upon to do that. And I enjoy getting to meet new families and doing that. But I also want to try to make the service that I would do a little more personal. So I like to try to, you know, get at least like an hour in with the next of kin and, hey, tell me about your loved one. And one of my favorite questions to ask is, if you could tell the world just one thing about your loved one, what would it be? If you want the world to just know one thing about them. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is you would be surprised how many times this question stumps people. And it honestly makes me feel a little sad. Like, and then it also makes me want to huddle my family and say, if someone ever asks you that, here's what you're going to say. <laughs> here's the things I want you to tell them that I want to be known for. And I will get some things that aren't, they're not bad. I mean, I'll get some things like, well, they love they the Kentucky Wildcats, you know, or they love gardening or, you know, whatever. They'll name some hobbies. Maybe they'll name how many years, decades they were at this one job or whatever. And you know what? Those are not bad things. But I don't know about you. Maybe it's because I'm getting a little older. But I'm like, I want to be known for something bigger than that, right? And it's not because, you know, I, I want to be famous or, I, you know, I, I don't think I'm being narcissistic. I think what's happening is I'm starting to realize that there are some things way more important than those things, right? And, and life is too short to make those things the most important things in our lives. And so I'm hoping that maybe in our time together, we might consider the possibility that we need to change our bumper sticker. The thing that we're known most for, you know, the thing that people think of when they think of us. Maybe there's some shifting that needs to take place. Listen, I, I get it because I probably, uh, there's a, probably a lot of people that know most about me that I love coffee and I like to run and whatever else, and I'm a sports fan too. I hope that if they spend even just a little bit more time around me than just a few minutes, that they would know that there was something bigger in my life than those things. So I want to talk to you about this uh, by reading a passage, really a quote from Jesus himself in the book of John chapter 13. And I want to sort of give you some context. The passage I'm about to read, verses 31 through 35, happened in between two pretty big events. What happens right before this is that Jesus had just partaken in a thing you may have heard of before called the Last Supper. A Passover meal happens right before Jesus ultimately is arrested, crucified, and resurrected, and ultimately ascended into heaven. So he had just partaken in the Lord's Supper. And then even a little bit more detail than that, right before what I'm about to read happens, he actually sends Judas, one of his 12 disciples, sends him out to go do what he's about to do. It's almost strange how in the book of John, Jesus just is so obvious about Judas, about being the one who's going to betray him. And at one point in the gospel narrative, the disciples were like saying, okay, Jesus says someone's going to betray him. Who do you think it is? Jesus at one point leans over to John and says, the one who I give the morsel of bread to. And so right before the passage I'm about to read happens, he gives that morsel to Judas and Judas takes off, leaving Jesus with the 11 disciples, not the 12. And then what happens right after the passage I'm about to read is that Jesus predicts that one of the most diehard followers in that room, Peter, 
ends up, he says, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. You're going to deny me. You're going to, you know, you're saying you'll follow me wherever I go, just like we just sang a little bit ago. <laughs> you're saying that, Peter, but you're actually going to deny I exist. So in between that, Jesus says this passage I'm about to read, and I would call this kind of the beginning of Jesus' farewell speech. Because if you read John 14, he goes into this long dialogue where he, he says something maybe you've heard before where he says, do not be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm about to go and prepare a place for you. And he goes into describing that. And then in John 15, he says some other things you may have heard before where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me, you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. And then he ultimately in John 17 voices this long, beautiful prayer for his disciples. And then he's arrested, dies on the cross, rises from the grave. But before all that, as he begins his farewell speech, now that I've given you all this crazy context, let me read to you what Jesus says. John 13, 31, he says, when he had gone out, that's Judas. Judas had just left to go betray him. When, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Very, um, I think it's a little bit of a strange verse there, but he's describing in this repetitive fashion about the glory of that is about to happen through events that are about to take place that are really huge. The cross, the resurrection. Jesus is expressing the ultimate glory of God the Father is about to be made real like never before. And then he turns to these 11 men. He refers to them as little children. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. <laughs> and it's true, not yet. First of all, they can't take the cross with him, and they definitely can't ascend into heaven with him once he does that. And then he says that to lead into these two verses. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So in that passage, he reveals to us what I would call is the ultimate Christian bumper sticker, and that's this. Love one another the way Jesus loves you. It sticks out to me that he calls this a new commandment because love one another is not a new commandment. It's all the way back in Deuteronomy. <laughs> when Jesus was questioned, which commandment? is the most important commandment in all of the law. Jesus would answer, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Loving others is like a foundational concept in all of Judaism and Christianity. And yet, Jesus says, I got something new for you. And you probably caught the nuance. It's a little different. Don't just love your neighbor like yourself. Love others the way I love you. Love people the way God loves you. It's different, isn't it? It's bigger. It's more sacrificial. Probably more difficult, you know? Now listen, you may be known for your hobbies. I know I am too. <laughs> you may be known for your passions about certain things, and I know that I am too. And yeah, you may be known for your personality or your personal style. There's things that everyone in here is known for that you may not be able to attach to a Bible verse. That's okay. But the point of this today is that Christ is telling us that this is the most important thing that you could ever do and be known for. How you love others. And how you love others the way he has loved you. It's the most important thing. And listen, just in case you're wondering, because I think that people can fall into this trap, you start imagining what that might look like. You don't have to have a certain personality to love people like this. You don't. You don't have to have a certain personal style 
certain passions. You don't have to have certain things about you, idiosyncrasies about you to be able to do this. In fact, I would argue that the, the more diversity of personality and style and hobbies and passions that exist of people doing this, that's how the world's going to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the last thing we need is cookie-cutter Christ followers. We need to be who God made us uniquely. What's cool about this, and I think this sometimes is easy for us to forget, Jesus doesn't command us to do something that we can't accomplish with his help. I mean, he's not saying, I'm going to give you a new command that you can't do it. <laughs> I'm going to give you a new command, but you're going to fail. <laughs> I'm going to give you a new command, and you're just never going to get it. You're never going to do it. No, Jesus dispenses this command to the disciples in this moment, and he dispenses it to us in this moment today, knowing that absolutely every one of us in this room, every one of us, following, listening, and watching online right here, right now. Every single one of us can do this. And it's why I wanted to make sure you knew what happened after this passage. Peter, the same guy who was the first one to say, I say you are the Messiah. I say you are the Christ. First one to finally say it. He was the only one that would step out of the boat to walk on water to go see Jesus. It took courage to do that. This guy, pretty, pretty hardcore Christ follower, he was the one who denied Jesus even existed in probably the most important moment when Jesus could use a little support from his friends. He denied it even existed. And so if you're thinking, eh, this sounds really cool, sounds like a good Christian bumper sticker, but me do this? Bill, if you only knew my past, Bill, if you only knew my present, <laughs> if you only knew my personality, if you only knew my struggles, if you only knew my anger, if you only knew my controversy, if you only knew my, my current status of life, like I gotta, I gotta start, I got, I got things to clean up before I can even think of doing this. Did you ever think that this was the cleanup? Did you ever think that this was the thing that transforms and turn, turns your life in a totally different direction? Because right after Jesus said this, Peter went out and did what he did. And he went on to be one of the greatest leaders of the church that we ever had. Died a martyr's death. Refused to be crucified the same way Jesus did. He demanded he be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to die the same way his Savior did. That was Peter. That was Peter. Man, you can do this. We can all do this, but how? Let me give you three things. How to love like Jesus. How do we do that? First, get to know Jesus' love for you. It's kind of the obvious thing that we miss. I think one of the barriers to us loving others the way Jesus loves us is that we really haven't soaked in the love of Jesus for ourselves yet. And I know that sounds a little bit weird and almost selfish a little bit, but it's not. Like, I would encourage you, we're in the season of Lent right now. You know, better time to just... Open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament of the Bible, and read it, and read it slowly. And look at what Jesus does. Listen to what he says. It's pretty incredible. You'll see him love a leper. You'll see him treat a Samaritan woman with dignity and offer her eternal life. A Roman centurion, and he, why would the Messiah, a great Jewish rabbi, give an oppressor like a Roman soldier the time of day, but yet he shows great compassion and performs a miracle of healing for him? That's Jesus. And then you see what he did when you get to the end of those books, the beatings, the crown of thorns, the cross, resurrection do you believe that he actually did that personally for you I believe one of the biggest biggest barriers to people's faith spiritually is they really don't believe Jesus loves them <laughs> it goes back to that simple little song Jesus loves me this I know but do you really know it you know I think there's a lot of people who've been attending church a long time, 
that can't love people this way because they really don't believe that Jesus loves them this way. And the reason I believe that is because I've met a lot of really, I'm going to just say sour Christ followers. It's like, man, some of us need to be woke up, slapped upside the face with the love of Jesus. We do. Because a lot of the other stuff that, that bogs us down will start melting away when you catch just a little glimpse of the adoration of the Father. So soak it in. Get to know his love for you. And secondly, start seeing yourself as a conduit of Jesus' love to others. In other words, I believe this with all my heart. I believe every single one of you were uniquely shaped and designed and created and placed to dispense his love to the people who you will come in contact with. I believe God is that specific and that intentional and that amazing. Uh, we had a men's conference locally in Burlington, and several of us men went and experienced that yesterday, and it was so encouraging. Some really cool things came from that. One of my favorite things I heard, I've always tried to figure out what's a good way to describe our mission field. Now, we, we try to talk about it here a lot. You know, we had this series called, you know, Bless. We talk about blessing the people that God puts in your path. And sometimes it's really hard to explain that. But this guy said it so well, and I love it. He said, we all have an ant trail. Have you seen a trail of ants? Man, it's like on a line. And when I see them, man, I'm like, I'm squirting that trail. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to end your trail. <laughs> I see what you're doing. I know where you're going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it. I'm going to break your trail. But we have that, right? We all do. You know, I live 1.1 mile from here. So a real big part of my ant trail is that 1.1 mile. I'm about, I'm about 1.3 miles to Skyline. I got that going on. I frequent that trail, you know. School, work. Do you go to the gym? Do you have hobbies there? you go to certain places to do? You have a trail. We're all creatures of habit. And there's other people on that trail too. And there's other people that will intersect that trail. That is not an accident. That is God. And right where you are as you're doing life on that ant trail, are you seeing that as this is where I dispense the love of Jesus? This is it. As I'm going, do you see yourself as a conduit for God's blessing? And listen, don't miss the obvious, guys. Don't miss the obvious. Are you dispensing Jesus' love to your spouse? Are, are you loving your kids like Jesus loves you? Hey, kids, there's some kids in the room. Are you loving your parents like Jesus loves you? I think it's easy to forget the people that are higher up, higher up on the org chart of our lives. They're humans who need love. Parents, grandparents, bosses. How about the, you know, there's the other things we know are the obvious, like our teammates, our classmates, our coworkers, our friends, even the strangers or moderate acquaintances. We don't know them well, but we see them on the ant trail. You know, I always see that person at Starbucks when I go there at this time every day, right? That's the ant trail, and it's not by accident. I'm going to give you one more thing that I think helps us to make this our bumper sticker. And it's a little bit more of a group effort thing. Start seeing the quote-unquote church as the ultimate example of love. And this is a good place for us to be reminded of something that I hope we've learned very well in the past two years. The church is so not a building, and it is so not an address, and it is so not a program. It is a people if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you want to find the church, look in the mirror. If you are sitting among Christ followers, like you probably are right here in this room today, look around you. This is the church, and the church is about to leave a building in a little bit and get on it all of its little separate ant trails and dispense the love of Jesus. But before we talk about that, start seeing the church as the ultimate experience, example of love, the reason this is so important is because Jesus was telling this to those 11 men. 
The world will know that you are my followers. The world will know that you are my disciples. The world will know that you are the church by how you love each other. This is the practicing ground of us loving people the way Jesus loves us. Let's start with the spiritual family. If you go back and read Acts chapter 2, especially the end of that chapter, it is so convicting. I believe what drew the people to the gospel in the first century was very little of what draws people to Christ often today. Sometimes we're like having to, I don't know, stand on our heads. <laughs> it's like, come on, come, come check Jesus out, you know. But I think we're missing a little bit of something what they had in the first century. Radical love, radical care. Man, in the first century, they would sell their houses and take the proceeds and take care of the needs in their church. Oh, man. We've not even begun to love one another that way. But if we start doing that just a little bit, the rest of the world is going to say, what in the world is going on at Hickory Grove? And they really care about each other. They're taking care of each other. They're treating each other like family. Friends, I believe with all my heart that is the missing step for reaching the world for Christ in this current new culture that we're in that is so full of hopelessness, darkness, depression, anxiety, and war, disease. People who are disconnected and lonely and needing to know what love really looks like. I hope and pray they find it at the church the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. So next steps, we talk about this every time we get together. The next step I invite all of us to, to consider taking today is, it's kind of simple, very basic thing, and that's open your eyes. That's it. We're not asking anybody to, let's go out and be Mother Teresa starting today, right? We're gonna just do all the things, right? Well, maybe if that's what God's telling you to do, go for it, I don't know. But how about we start with something very simple and basic? Oh, Lord, open our eyes. Do you see how much Jesus loves you? Do you see it? Do you see the people God has placed in your life that he wants you to give that love to? Do you see the church it's not just a thing you attend. Not just an organization at 11969 Taylor Mill Road. But do you see it as this global family of people who have been loved so sacrificially that all we are going to do the rest of our days is love one another? I think our vision needs helped a little bit by God. I don't know about you, but I'm going to pray for God to open my eyes so I can see his love better, so I can see my ant trail better and to see it the way he sees it, and so I can see this better. May we be known by loving other people the way he has loved us. Let's ask him to help us do that as we pray. Will you bow with me? Father, I'm reminded today how much I need you. You're awesome. I'm desperate for you, God. I, I can't even love without your love. So Father, I pray right now that you remove the blinders from my eyes and help me to see I mean, to see your love better. I mean, to know it and believe it. Father, help me to start seeing all the people that you put in my path. Help me to see them the way you see them. And Father, help me to see myself as the conduit of your love to them. Help me to not leave it for someone else to do. Help me to seize every moment of every day to love like that. And Lord, 
I'm so blessed to be called to be the pastor of this church. But, oh, Lord, far be it from me to not lead us to love one another in sacrificial serving ways. So, Father, help me to do that. Lord, there might be someone watching or listening or in this room that has never placed their faith in you. May they take that childlike step of faith, just like Raylan did we celebrated her baptism earlier. Just say yes to you. Your word promises for everyone who calls on your name will be saved. If someone's not done that yet, help them to know you are right here. You love them and you died for them. And you want to live with them and walk with them the rest of their days. Thank you for the free gift of eternal life that you offer to us today. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.